Okay, it is 1201 on the East Coast, and so we're going to get started. Hi, everyone. I'm Brad Rathgaber, the head of school and CEO of One Schoolhouse, and I'm not Sarah Hanewald, who normally hosts these webinars. Uh, Sarah is on vacation this week. She's taking a spring break, and so Liz and I get to uh, uh, get to uh, join you today for today's webinar. Just a couple of reminders here as we get going. Um, the first is that today's topic is on restoring and renewing this summer. Uh, on our blog, you will see a wonderful post from Liz on filling our buckets, and we'll be talking about that analogy here in just a minute. Next week's webinar will be on academics for equity. We're really excited about this topic, and I know that you'll enjoy hearing from um, some folks on our team on the courses that they're building and how we might think about building a curriculum um, that is equitable and just. Please do note that the advanced independent curriculum frameworks are out and that you can download your copy of the principles and standards on independentcurriculum.org and that summer professional development is also out. There's a brand new course up there that we announced, uh, I believe on Tuesday or on Sunday, technology considerations for academic leaders, thinking of tech, academic leaders think about all the different technology that they've brought into their classroom or they've trained their faculty on in the school year, unlike any other, and to consider what stays and what goes moving forward. Also note that we have a couple of additional professional development opportunities, including a Reflect, Restore, and Renew course, both for teachers and academic leaders this summer, and the Building Trust course, which has been hugely popular, uh, will also be run this summer. So let's talk about summer, Liz. Um, as folks are uh, have questions on the topics that we talk about today, also don't feel uh, don't uh, hesitate to use the Q and A function of this webinar for any questions that you have. Liz and I won't be monitoring the chat for questions, but we will be monitoring the Q and A for questions. So, Liz, I'm going to throw a bunch of questions at you in regards to what students need for the summer to start with. And then I know you're going to throw a few questions at me in terms of what faculty and academic leaders need for professional development this summer. Let's just start real simple. You know, you wrote a blog post about filling your bucket this summer and helping our students fill their buckets this summer. Can you talk about just what that analogy is and why it's so important to consider in this summer? Sure. So um, I was introduced to this analogy when my kids were in preschool and their teachers talked to them about um, filling their buckets, about filling a bucket as a way to be kind and to uh, to honor who people were. And so they would teach um, the, the little kids that the little kids in their class that, you know, when somebody had done something that hurt their feelings, they said, you emptied my bucket. Um, mm -hmm. And when somebody did something kind, they would say, oh, you filled my bucket. It was a way to sort of make that concrete. Um, but this concept has been one that we've used in our family for many years. And it's one, been one that I've found myself, especially this year, bringing more and more into the professional space. This idea that we have a sense of self and a sense of wellness that can be filled or can be emptied. Um, and over the course of this year, for a lot of us, um, we've seen a lot of withdrawals. We've seen a lot of a lot of liquid come out of that bucket. Um, and so for many of us, we are approaching summer on empty. You can use that metaphor as a gas tank or as a bucket, whichever you'd like. Um, for some of us, that bucket is actually broken. Like you could, there are holes in it. You could put a lot of water in it and it still couldn't hold anything. People have been through a experience that at its best was difficult and at its worst was highly traumatic. So summer needs to fill us back up. There are two reasons to do that. One is that just we're people, we're people and we need to take care of ourselves. But the second is particular to our context as educators. And that's that when human beings and this is adults and children, when human beings are stressed, have been experiencing chronic, ongoing, long-term stress, have been dealing with uncertainty and isolation, they're physically unable to effectively learn. Learning loss this year, and I could spend another 20 minutes talking about that phrase, as Brad could too, but I'm going to use it because it's a good shorthand at the moment. Um, Learning loss isn't because teachers didn't know how to do effective online or because you can't teach as much online. It's because 
kids literally couldn't learn as much this year because they were dealing with a world that had turned upside down for them. And in order to be able to learn effectively, in order to make next year as positive as it can, in order to help kids make as much growth and progress as they can next year, we need to spend this summer filling back up that sense of wellness and well being so that they're ready to learn. The, taking care of, uh, I'll use some unscientific terms here, their hearts and their minds and their spirits is the way that we're going to help them really become, reach back up to the levels of learning that we could see when they had more stability in their lives. Liz, I think one of the things you talked about in the blog that I know you want to expand on a little bit here too, is that filling your bucket means different things for different kids. And I really appreciate you actually going back to that preschool thing because it was about the student, it was about the kid saying, you've filled my bucket or you've emptied my bucket helping each other understand that different things can fill or empty buckets for different types of kids. Can you talk about like what that might look like for a range of kids for the mm -hmm. summer? Sure. So one of the things that's been hard about this year is that there are so many things that kids haven't been able to do. And some of our students come to school because they love being in class, like they love working with their teacher and they love the academics. Um, and some of them come to school because, you know, happily, because they really love being in a place with a lot of kids. And some of them come to school because they love athletics. And when they're here, they're all active and engaged learners, but the motivation to get them walking across the threshold is really different kid by kid. Um, and for many of our students, the things that got them walking across the threshold this year disappeared. And so for those students, you know, this is the anal this is uh, analogous to being a learner driven classroom, we need to have a learner driven summer that for the student who fills back up when they are on the lacrosse field, like let's give that kid a chance to play lacrosse and to give to give her a sense of confidence and competence and achievement that she's been missing um, for the student who is the serious artist you know, to find a community where he can be creating with other students and, and come back together so that he feels like that part of, of who he is has been acknowledged. Um, I'm going to borrow the words here of my colleague, the great and good Peter Gao, who is a, a guest on this webinar. Some kids need to go sit out in nature on a rock and look at trees. Some, you know, we some kids need solitude and reflection this summer and that's as worthy and also some kids need academics yeah. some kids really do get you know that is the thing that 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 gives them that excitement is the ability to dig in and go deep um and in a year where you know where everybody learned something, but we weren't always learning in the ways that made us most comfortable or that were most aligned to our learning preferences, giving those kids that chance is really important. Um, likewise, there are some students who are really stressed out by their perception of what they haven't learned. That's their need, not their parents and not their schools. And for those kids spending the summer helping them see how competent they are and how ready they are to go on to the next academic year, that's a good use of time for them. So Liz, it strikes me that this is a really different framework than what school leaders and parents are being bombarded with in the press right now. Um, if the focus in the press and media is on learning loss, one, we know for some students, and I keep going back to the great webinar that Sarah did with Tom Rashawn from ERB a few weeks ago. Yeah. If you haven't seen it, please go back to the webinar archive on the One Schoolhouse website to look at it, which does show that some kids have actually found even greater academic success this year too. For those kids, again, it, it seems that this has filled their bucket, so to speak, to continue to use that analogy, right? Um, and then again, there are those kids who you just said, you know, might be so worried about potential learning loss that it is right for them to fill their bucket by making sure that those skills are shored up. How though do we help parents as academic leaders, as academic leaders, how do we help parents understand what's right and best for their kid and that 
that kind of go, go, go pressure, particularly around this topic that they're hearing all about with learning loss is not just, you know, the wave that keeps crashing down. Oh, that's, that's a hard one because the administrators who I speak to feel really confident that they know where their students are. And that means that next year they're going to meet their students where they are. And I think that for academic leaders, that is the thing that is most important for parents to hear. We know that in September, the students who walk through our door are going to be coming with a much wider range of their knowledge bases than we've seen in a long time. Um, that's true of students who are returning to our school. It's triply true of our new enrollments. Um, you know, some of our students have come from schools where they've been getting consistent instruction. Um, and some of our students may not be setting in a physical class, but in a physical classroom all year. Schools need to reassure parents, first of all, that, that they've got that, that, you know, that, that, that they have a way to assess where students are, that nobody is behind. I, when some people use that metaphor, like, I'm always wondering, like, what is the thing they're behind? Because it's definitely an imaginary something. But like sometimes I think it's an elephant and sometimes I think it's a bus and anyways. Um, so schools need to be able to articulate to parents, we have this under control. We know how to handle this. Um, and to speak to another big invisible thing in the room, this is not going to be, this is not the thing that is going to drive your child's opportunities when it comes time for the college application process. Um, your child, what I wish more folks were saying is that um, a lot of parents seem to have, and I, I, I am a parent myself, so I'm going to, you know, implicate myself here too. Um, a lot of parents um, seem to have this sense that, that, that the past 12 months have only happened to their child, that everybody else has just been going along like normal. Um, and we are all in the same storm. We are in different boats, but we are in the same storm. And I think the more schools can reassure parents that the thing that they do right now is, they re is that they figure out what their kids need to go into the next academic year with a sense of wholeness and readiness, because that's what will turbocharge their learning. Um, as my, our colleague and great friend of one schoolhouse, Lisa Demore said, 12 months ago, she said, the goal here for this pandemic is intact psychological survival. When we have that, everything else will follow. Thanks for bringing Lisa into that conversation as always. So, so Brad, can I ask you a few questions now? I, you can, I'm just gonna remind folks of a couple of things. One that I realized I didn't say at the start, as always, we closed caption these webinars. And so if you, if closed captioning is helpful for you, please just click the closed caption button at the bottom of the webinar. And as we go through this, please don't hesitate to uh, put any questions that you might have either for Liz or me uh, into the chat. We're happy to answer those questions as we go along. And uh, I think Liz only has a couple of questions for me. So we're, we'll jump into your questions here real soon. Um, so uh, we've been talking about the buckets of our students. Brad, how are our educators' buckets looking right now? Oh my gosh, I just I started my little intro to to our Tuesday mailing with I just can't wait for the summer, and I, I <laughs> think that every teacher, every administrator, anybody who works in schools, just yeah, yeah, like <laughs> let's find a beach somewhere and let's let's have a little bit of a summer. Um, so, I, I mean, I think everybody is feeling that same thing too. Hopefully folks that have just had spring break or, or are going into spring break have a little bit of that respite now to get through the last couple of months. But I mean, I think all around us, we see kids who are struggling, we see teachers who are struggling, we see fellow administrators who are struggling. Everybody's just tired. Everybody's just been going, going, going for now 13 months really straight um, working through the pandemics. and. Um, and they also need to have their buckets filled. Um, Liz, I really appreciate what you said about thinking about how individual students can have those buckets filled. I think that's super true for faculty members too. To not think of faculty as a collective whole, but instead to think about what can I make sure as an academic leader I can do to help make sure that each one of my faculty members comes back whole. Liz, when you and I were chatting yesterday, you said something that really just made me laugh out loud. 
you said to me, this is not the summer to have your faculty read good to great. <laughs> <laughs> and it just was like, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is almost certainly the summer not to have like a faculty read, or if the faculty read is out there, it's not on something that's like moving everybody forward in terms of a professional development skill that we have or, you know, anything like that. It's, it's really, it's really about giving folks some time to reflect on their terms, to restore, to renew, um, in large part because, yeah, we all recognize that there's some serious work that we're going to have going forward. You know, Liz, you said a second ago that it's important for parents to hear from schools, we got this. We know what we are going to have to do in order to help your children find success when they come back to campus next fall. But don't really worry about that till next fall. Well, we can tell our fa families that we got this, but we also know as educators, we got a little work to do in order to say, in order to get to the point that we got this, right? That's okay. Before going to that place of what do we have to do and getting into that whole mindset and mantra and challenge set of challenges ourselves though, we know that every academic leader, that every faculty member, that every educator is going to have to have a chance to restore and renew themselves before they can reflect on what happened during this crazy year so that when they do come back to campus in August of this coming school year or for the next school year, we can start to have the conversations around what types of pieces of the curriculum were missed, what competencies do we need to go back to, what learning objectives do we need to reinforce, how are we going to make sure that we reach each student where they are. We can't, though, jump into those questions today. Nobody's ready to jump into those questions today. Um, and we need to give everybody a chance to fill those buckets up before before jumping into those questions. Um, so you said you know, faculty faculty and administrators really need some time to reflect. But how can administrators um, and academic leaders help them do that? How do we give them frameworks and time to make sure that that happens? That's a that's a great question. You know, Liz, I've been uh, helping to run uh, online professional development, summertime professional development for faculty for a number of years, and I'm often asked by academic leaders, "What's the best time of the summer to run professional development for faculty?" And I'll tell them that it is absolutely and totally dependent upon the faculty member. The best time is when the person is ready for that work. And what I've recognized even pre-pandemic, and I think this will be especially true this summer, is that there is some number of faculty members who actually does like to engage in the restoral, restoration and, and renewal and reflection uh, right after the school year is done. You all know who some of those faculty members are. Those are the faculty members who spend a lot of the summer revising their curriculums, rethinking different projects that they have in their classes, you know, picking out new books that they're going to be um, exploring with their students. Those are the faculty members who are the students that Liz was talking about, who have their buckets filled by engaging deeply in that academic and curricular work. That's maybe 30% of your faculty, right? There's another percent of your faculty that likes to take some time off before engaging in that work. And then likes to take some time off again before coming back in August. There's a whole other set of faculty that as soon as that bell rings on that last day or that last kid walks across the stage on graduation doesn't want to think about that school for two months. All of those are appropriate, right? Like all of those types of things are appropriate. And so I think that it's going to be helpful for academic leaders to again try to engage with faculty members on their terms going into the summer rather than your terms. Don't think, okay, I got three professional development days in June and then I've got three professional development days in August and here's how I'm gonna do this and here's how this is gonna scaffold and here's how this is like, if you do that, you are going to lose two thirds of your audience those days in June. So instead, think about how you can create structures that allow faculty to restore themselves and to reflect on the school year unlike any other at the moments of times when it's right for them rather than at the moments of times when it's right for you. And I think that some of the online tools and spaces that we've been developing can allow for that asynchronous engagement um, that's more on the terms of the faculty member than on the terms of the administrator. Does that help, Liz? Yeah, that's great. Um, so um, let me ask about the role of summer reading, um, both for students and for teachers. Um, is summer reading 
the right tool to use this summer? I don't personally. And I say I, that as a former card carrying English teacher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I personally, I, I don't think so. Although, Liz, I know you might even have a thought on like, if, if you are doing summer reading, you said to me yesterday that it might be around some like novel related to traumatic experiences. You want to share your thoughts on that? Uh, sure. I think, was, you know, in, in the context of this, trying to think of um, of, of reading that will let people um, reflect on their own experiences. And so, you know, I, I, I did say sort of tongue in cheek, like, I don't think it's the summer for good to great, but it may well be this a summer for talking, for reading a book about um, the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina mm -hmm. and in looking at how communities rebound and find resilience. It may be the summer for um, for reading a novel about that um, you know that's written in multiple voices, where you think about what it means to have a community share an experience, but still have very different experiences of their own. Mm -hmm. Don't think this is the summer for the didactic reading. I think this is the summer for the reflective and the um, digressive read. Yeah. Um... Uh, our, our friend Peter uh, would, if he was in this conversation right now on the screen right now, he would probably tell us to make sure that summer reading books are not used as a place for catch up either. Um, either, and I think that goes either for faculty or for students. Yeah, yeah. If you're gonna have people read, I think I always believe this, and I said, let's say this is, it should be something that they're going to enjoy, not something just that they're going to get something out of, but that enjoyment is a value in itself. Um, and it's one that, you know, that as uh, for, that for schools that are um, filled with highly motivated and high achieving students, we sometimes forget that enjoyment is, um, is, is meaningful on its own, not just as a means to, uh, not just as a carrot to get people to do stuff that's good for them. So Emily has a question in here. Um, and again, folks, feel free to put any questions that you have into the Q&A area. She notes, uh, quote, slow growth uh, has been a term I've heard here uh, and now used frequently. I'm wondering how the term learning loss is used today. Yeah, Emily, let me start on that by just saying, I think we're using learning loss because that's what we're seeing in the popular yes. press. That is not a term that we like to use. That is not a term that we do use typically. We're just using that as shorthand. I, we totally agree with you that that slow growth is a better way to describe this. And again, I'd go back to that, uh, that uh, webinar with Tom from ERB noting that some kids have seen accelerated growth this year too. Yeah, I should have put that in air quotes, quite frankly, um, because that's the term that we see being used to sort of fan this uh, panic about progress and about progress. Um, that we don't, I will tell you that we as an organization do not feel panicked about. Um, I think that the amount of learning that students have been able to do this year is actually fairly extraordinary. And that to assume that they should have hit the same benchmarks that in a year without um, trauma and upheaval is um, Absurd is the nicest word that I can come up with it. Um, I think it's uh, damaging, actually. Um, so thank you for reminding me that I should have clarified that term a little bit better, because um, it's not the one that we're walking around saying, um, unless we're putting it in scare quotes. Yeah. Liz, how, what are you hearing from fellow parents? I, I know you are in the Bay Area. I'm in DC. These are two pretty high pressure environments. Um, what are some of the things you're hearing from parents right now um, that that has you worried um, about what this summer might look like for students? And again, if there are any other um, uh, tips or tools or uh, places that academic leaders can help reshape those conversations. So in terms of places to reshape, um, for older students, I always value the work of our colleagues at Challenge Success. Um, for I, they do tremendous resource uh, research and provide tremendous resources. Um, 
it's not our target. We know that mostly we don't have a ton of K-8 folks on here, but for those people, I would recommend the resources at Let's Grow, which is about free range parenting, um, but really is about talking about fostering independence, resilience, and autonomy for kids. Um, so I think that those are both places where, um, where they're adding a different kind of, um, of perspective to the conversation about what the goals of parenting are that um, are different from the ones we sometimes get in our schools or hear from the parent communities in our schools. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a lot of anxiety um, about, I think this um, more accurately, I don't think how to say this. The, the concern that I am hearing that I wish I were hearing less is not about what next year is going to look like. It's about the college admissions process. Mm. Um, there are two reasons I think that's a mistake. Actually, there's a lot. I'll go with two main ones. Um, the first is that um, high school is not an audition for college. The years that students have in high school are their own are their own set of goals. It is not, uh, you know, the, the name prep school is sort of the thing that I think trips us up. This isn't preparatory for college. This is about meeting adolescents with their needs and helping them grow the way that works for them. Um, but the second thing is that the college admissions process is changing drastically. Um, that started this year with, with how many schools went test optional um, and with the way that schools had to figure out how to evaluate applications in a new way because kids were different and kids' experiences were different. Um, and I think that there's a lot of anxiety about that. Um, and it's, it strikes me as a lot of anxiety about something that we don't actually even know what it's gonna be. So I, I wish we could just sort of focus on thinking of high school as meeting our children's needs in the moment they're in. Um, but I also think that every summer. <laughs> <laughs> well, and to that end, uh, like another webinar, I'm going to point folks back to that Peter and Sarah and Emmy Harvard from Access yes. did a couple of weeks ago on college counseling and how the college counseling world is changing, how college admissions world is changing so quickly right now. Please go back and see that webinar too. It's another outstanding one. Well, Liz, thank you for taking some time today to talk about how we can make sure that our students and our educators have the best summer ever. Um, thank you all for joining us and everybody have a wonderful day. Thanks, everybody.